1960s when computer modeling was beginning, the first, uh, I think, model forecast was made in about 1950 from a very simple computer in those days, extremely simple one. Um, then in the 1960s, it began to be the experimental forecasts were made um, from larger computers. And then, of course, the 19, and this was just for the atmosphere, for meteorological weather forecasting. In the 1970s, people began to model the climate and so on, and things began to move on, that, on that, in that sort of way. What is computer modeling? What do you do in a computer model? What you do not do is just use statistics and extrapolate from the past. If you have an e a model of the economics of the system of the world, you, you use correlations between different things that, that have occurred in the past and try to forecast for the future using statistical correlations from the past. That is not what you do in, in meteorological forecasting. You use the basic equations of motion, you use all the physical equations of state of the, or of the Earth's atmosphere, you use the basic physics, and basic dynamics, the real chemistry and the real biology, all sorts of things. You're using what we really know about the basic structure of, of, our, of, our, of our Earth. And the things you need to, of course, keep track of, you need to keep track of the atmospheric density at all places, because that drives the motion, and the composition is also very important because of its radiation input, and also because it influences the density and so on. So you need all those things, and you need to do it over the, over the whole atmosphere, in, in a grid, in a, in a put here taking the distribution of the whole atmosphere. You need to do it, of course, over the whole Earth as well. I'll show you that in a minute. And you need to worry about the surface exchange of heat and momentum, the friction and water vapor at the surface. And you need to uh, allow the radiation coming in and the radiation going out. All that has to be described in your model. <coughs> and the model um, has to be, of course, operate over the whole of the Earth's surface if you're going to have a global model. So you have to make a grid system and, and measure, um, the simplest way of thinking about it is you're, you're taking all the parameters at each of these points of the Earth's surface, and not just on the, on the surface, you'll have to go up in the atmosphere too and measure the heights, and measure the, uh, or consider the value of these parameters at different levels and feed all that into the model. Now about 1990, the best we could do for, for, for a global model was to have a resolution of about 300 kilometers if you were going to integrate the equations of motion for any reasonable time. And that's the sort of picture of, the, of Europe with a 300 kilometer resolution. So it's really not very good. The topography, the mountains don't influence it properly and the variations with, with space and source are, are not really put in there very well. Nevertheless, you can still get a, a description of the global climate looking at that sort of resolution. Move to 2007 and you've got something less than 100 kilometres you can use uh, and still integrate for, for, for a period of time, like months or years, and that's the sort of description you've got and you can see that's very much better and we're doing a much better job there now than we were then. All thanks to computers. If you go from 1950 over the last 60 years, the um, power of computers has gone up by about a factor of 10 every five or six years. And it's a remarkable straight line on a log graph. And it still seems to be carrying on. How long it will carry on for, I don't know. But it's a remarkable story, is the whole of our computing power story. And um, you'll be very aware of that, and the potential today is enormous compared with what it used to be. I, the Earth Simulator, in, with the largest, I think, computer in the world used at all for Earth, Earth uh, experiments, is the Earth Simulator at uh, Yokohama in Japan, which is, um, which is vast. <laughs> it's a very big, it's a very big, even bigger than the first computers, which were made out of valves and not transistors. And they occupied enormous amounts of space, too. That's the Earth Simulator, and that's a picture of a typhoon. A uh, simulation of a typhoon carried out on the Earth simulator with a, a resolution of about 20 kilometres, I think. So it really is giving you a description of a typhoon, which is uh, remarkably detailed and 
and showing the power of computing at that sort of scale. So we've had these two enormous technical revolutions, space observations and computer modelling, which have enabled us to move along in, the, in, 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 in these, these very important ways. I talked about meteorological forecasting, that when you take account just of the atmosphere and the surface, that's all. But now if you're going to do the climate, and you're going to integrate not just for a day, and predict over a day, you're going to try and predict for 100 years, if you have a climate model. So you have to take into account of all sorts of processes you don't need in just pure meteorology. And there's a picture of them all. Um, you've got to take account of the, uh, uh, the various components of the climate system, the land, the ocean, the ice, the, uh, the biosphere, and all the changes which occur there, and the hydrosphere too, the, the hydrological cycle, the, the rivers and the, way, uh, and the movement of water through the whole system, and the change there might be in the solar inputs, and the changes there might be in other things which, uh, which you have here, uh, the Earth's surface and its albedo, or the sort of vegetation you've got, or might have, and the influence of, uh, of everything you can imagine in terms of composition in the atmosphere, cloudiness, volcanic eruptions, and all those things, you've got an enormous task to carry out in trying to simulate all of those things in, in a model, uh, in a computer global climate model. In particular, you've got to get uh, the atmosphere and the ocean coupled together and get that right. Because the atmosphere drives the ocean, because wind the wind over the surface of the ocean is the, is a, is, is the most important parameter in, de in determining the ocean circulation. And then the, the ocean in its turn has a different temperature at the surface. It's, it, it, water is evaporated from the ocean. That water contains heat, latent heat. And the, the temperature of the ocean surface and the state of the ocean surface has a tremendous amount to do with how the atmosphere works. And you have to have that coupling together really very carefully done. And that's over 10 or 50, the last 20 years. We've learned how to do that in a way which seems to work rather well. We had to, uh, we had to fudge it for a long time to make sure that these exchanges were correct and, and make them correct by artificial means. We no longer need to do that. And it's remarkable how that now works. There were big feedbacks in the climate system. Um, some positive and some negative. First is water vapor feedback, very easy to understand. If you, have, uh, if you increase the temperature, average temperature of the Earth because of increased carbon dioxide, for instance, then you get increased water vapor because you would get more evaporation from the surface. And water vapor is also a big greenhouse gas. So you roughly double the effect because of the increased water vapour. And that's a positive feedback. Um, and, and so on. Um, cloud radiation feedback. Clouds, I'll say more about that in a minute. If you melt ice, ice tends to reflect sunlight. You melt some of that ice and replace it by water. The water doesn't. It absorbs sunlight, not reflecting it. And so you immediately add energy to the system in a big way. So they have a big positive feedback there, you melt ice, and then that makes more ice melt because you've got more sunshine to absorb, and therefore the, the positive feedback continues. There's one negative feedback that I put in, and that's carbon, increased carbon dioxide actually helps some crops to grow better. If you want big tomatoes, you fill your greenhouse with carbon dioxide. And that's actually done, that's how you get big tomatoes. And so that's taking carbon from the system and therefore removing carbon from the atmosphere because of that, that effect, and that's acting as a negative feedback on the, on the, on the global warming system. And there's, and there's a climate carbon cycle feedback, which I haven't time to explain, but it is if you increase the temperature, carbon, tends, carbon in the soil tends to respirate and come out of the soil, 
So that as you increase the temperature, you get more carbon, and therefore that increases the temperature more, and so it goes on. So that's another important positive feedback uh, 